Welcome to the Alex Jones Show on this Sunday live edition. I'm David Knight, your host. Alex Jones is going to be joining us at the bottom of the hour with a special report. Of course, you've probably seen this video about, it's up on Infowars.com, about the barbecue police coming in and grilling their neighbors over the smoke. There's a lot more to it than just that. This is something that has a very, very broad agenda. Agenda 21 is part of it. We've also seen other aspects. We've seen movements in Austin to get rid of barbecue. The famous Franklin Barbecue here in Austin. The Austin City Council would like to essentially shut them down because they said, we certainly can't, as, as well as they do. And I mean, people line up at this barbecue. I've never been able to eat there. I, I've, I've been here for over three years. I've never been able to actually get into the restaurant and never have the time to go through the line or they run out of food. This famous barbecue said, they can't comply with these regulations. Certainly the smaller restaurants can't comply with it. It is over the top. We're seeing wood stoves being banned. We're seeing barbecue being banned. And of course, there's the war on coal. We have an article on Infowars.com about a coal executive, uh, Murray Energy CEO, Robert Murray, talking about how the president is trying to destroy not only the coal industry, but the United States as well. He has some spot on comments. We're going to cover that as well. It's an amazing day, as I said in news. There's uh, articles about what is being done to our children. You will not believe this article up on Infowars.com, an anti-bullying conference where middle schoolers learn about lesbian strap-on anal sex and fa fake testicles. This is just amazing. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about pre-crime being extended to kindergartners, okay? And this is all part of the government's vast... Uh, surveillance state that they're putting in place. It's one of the things that can, should concern everyone about the Jade Helm exercise. It's part of that continuum. It's a very dangerous part of that continuum, especially when you look at what's going on in the UK. Just three days ago, we see that Theresa May, the Home Secretary in the UK, emphatically rejected the use of water cannons in England and Wales. And she had some very strong statements to talk about how they did not want the UK police to hide behind military-style equipment and tactics. But then just three days later, this story at Infowars.com, secret plan for soldiers to fight terror in the UK. This is coming out of Sky News. Just three days after she says, we're not going to have militarized police. Don't worry, you can trust us. We're going to protect your freedoms. We want to have consensual police. Uh, we don't want to hide behind the military. Now they're talking about how they've already put in place a plan to put up to 5,000 soldiers immediately out if there is some kind of a terror attack. Now many people would say, great, I'd like to see that. You need to understand how this is all playing out. You need to understand this in the full context of the surveillance state, in terms of grabbing everyone's information, in terms of profiling people, not just down to regional groups, not just down to targeting a specific building or a specific vehicle, but targeting individuals. We have a uh, revelation about the future of war coming from a military think tank sponsored by the Department of Defense. But of course, those things are already here. They're already looking at individuals. We've got Wesley Clark talking about internment camps, saying you got a right to be disloyal and criticize the government, but we're going to lock you up for that. At the same time, of course, Wesley Clark is a former candidate for president with the Democrat Party. We've also got the Republicans joining in. Of course, they love the war on terror. They love the surveillance state. We've got Mike McCall at the same time Wesley Clark is floating this idea that anyone who is disloyal, of course, you've got a right to say whatever you want to, he said, but we've got a right to lock you up, to segregate you, as he euphemistically calls it. At the same time, we've got Mike McCall creating a new division of Homeland Security to be funded by FEMA that is going to identify individuals before they do anything. This is all part of pre-crime. Everything you do now, everything you do on social media, everything you do going into kindergarten, every institution, they're going to look at what you're doing. Stay with us. We're going to break these down in detail after the break. Alex Jones is going to be joining us at the end of the hour with a report. I'm here live. We'll possibly take your calls also later in the program. Of course, today we see uh, something in a special Sunday session that uh, Rand Paul is trying to do. We've all seen the videos. I presume you've seen the videos by now. You've probably taken one position or the other on this. It's, it's pretty amazing to see Planned Parenthood talking about uh, profiting from baby parts at the same time saying that, well, they're 
tissue, their fetuses. No, they're baby body parts that they're selling for money. Many of us have had enough of this. It's, it's repulsive. It's uh, immoral. It should be illegal, but it is funded by our government. Rand Paul is going to try to block this today in a special Sunday session. This is an article on Infowars.com. Paul is going to try to block Planned Parenthood funding during a rare Sunday voting session. He says, I really think the time has come in our country to have a debate on whether taxpayer money should be spent on this. And, of course, this is something in terms of how it's going to work. I'm not really sure. It's a long shot legislative maneuver, Fox News said. He's going to try to submit a discharge position to force the vote when senators return today in Washington to vote on a transportation and transit funding bill set to expire in a few days. So we'll see what happens. I certainly appreciate him uh, trying to do something about this. We've got other presidential news as well. Hillary Clinton has uh, got a lot of news about her emails uh, that broke on uh, at the end of the week. Also, uh, we've had some uh, comments from Donald Trump about the report that uh, Josh Owens and Joe Biggs filmed at the border showing uh, drug smugglers coming across the border. He talked about that in Iowa. And now a lot of people are talking about that. A lot of them are very uh, skillfully avoiding uh, mentioning Infowars. Uh, some of them do, like the Daily Caller. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his comments. And I want to talk a little bit about what the real solution might be. Maybe we ought to took, take a look at what the real problem is in terms of uncontrolled immigration. This is not something that is just involving people coming from one particular country. People are coming in from all different countries. And I want to get to that, but I want to run down the uh, the... The headline news here that's happening today, we've got uh, more information about this uh, Sandra Bland case here in Texas, uh, the person who reportedly committed suicide after being arrested for a very minor traffic offense, uh, not using her turn signal. And of course, if you've seen the reports that we have at Infowars.com on our YouTube channel, uh, you can see that we've got... Um, Oh, I can't remember the guy's name. What's the guy's name, uh, CJ, uh, that, that does reports about how to handle police encounters? Anyway, we'll get that name for you. But you can see the report Larry, there. Larry Craig. Larry Craig. Thank you so much. Larry Craig talks about how to handle a police encounter. And he makes a very interesting point. He says when the police pull you over, most of the time, of course, they're, they're looking for revenue, for traffic revenue, and that sort of thing. Most of the time, they really want to try to get you on some kind of a drug offense. That's really where they, the money is. And so this cop was very intent on getting her out of the car. She got very angry. She was arrested. She spent three days in jail. Then they said she committed suicide by hanging herself with some garbage bags tied together. That looks suspicious enough. Now it gets even more suspicious. To try to cover this up, because a lot of people are not buying that story. It doesn't sound very plausible. Now they come up with something else to try to make it sound uh, more plausible, but it does just the opposite. Now they're telling us that it is some kind of a reefer madness uh, that, that caused her to commit suicide. They say that she had a massive amount of marijuana that she smoked in jail. Remember, she's been there three days. They admitted her into jail. She didn't come into the jail with the marijuana. They would have checked her for that. But she's been there three days. Then she hangs herself. Then they say she's consumed a massive amount of marijuana just before she hung herself. How does that get them off the hook? I really don't understand. They say, looking at the autopsy results and toxicology, it appears that she swallowed a large quantity of marijuana or smoked it in jail, and they didn't happen to notice either of those things. You know, stuff like this does happen in jail. It, I think, underscores that we cannot stop drug use by incarcerating people. We have a lot of people in federal prison who die of drug overdoses every year because you can't stop people from using it even if you lock them up. So what kind of a society are we creating for ourselves when we try to stop drug use, when we try to stop vice by use of a militarized police force? It simply doesn't work. But I don't believe that's the situation in this particular case. They say, and this is... Uh, uh, the report from Met Press, in terms of summarizing it, they say the officer seemed to be more interested in searching Bland in her vehicle. He indicated he would let her go with a warning, but he wanted her out of her vehicle to do a search. 
things turned ugly when she asserted her rights and refused to consent to the search or to put out her cigarette. You do have a right to refuse a search. When you're pulled over, you are under arrest. You're under custodial arrest. That has been uh, proven over and over again and ruled on by the courts. I know that when we got... Uh, uh, arrested at AP Hill, Joe Biggs and I, uh, the guy cynically said, no, no, you're not under arrest. And so well, then we're free to go. No, you can't go. Uh, <laughs> they know that. They won't call it an arrest. They'll play semantic games with you. But uh, this is absolutely amazing that they would now try to push this onto reefer madness. But we're seeing this happen everywhere. Even when they prosecute uh, police officers for Excessive force for wrongful death, they get a slap on the wrist. Look at this situation here in L.A. A former veteran L.A. Police Department officer sentenced uh, to beating a handcuffed woman who later died. She gets off with 20 months, 20 months, which means that she's only going to serve 16 months in county jail. She's going to get credit for three months that she's already been in jail. She kicked she shoved, she beat a woman who was handcuffed, and that's all she's going to get. Under cover of law, why do we allow that to happen? Changing uh, gears quickly here, getting on to the presidential campaigns. Bernie Sanders, of course, is one of these candidates who's been rising in the polls because compared to Hillary Clinton, he looks very authentic. He looks, he comes across as a very genuine, authentic guy. Look at this article, however. He's demanding $15 per hour minimum wage. He's just introduced a bill to do that. Yet he pays his own interns $12 an hour. So you're going to make it <laughs> make it a law, but you're not going to do that. It's simply perception, folks. It's simply perce perception for all these folks uh, that are doing this. Hillary Clinton, of course, uh, had a press conference where she's talking about the uh, newest report from the inspector general looking at whether or not she was using uh, sending classified emails from her personal account. And she said, I am confident that I never sent or received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. <laughs> I heard her say this going past the mainstream monitors that we have throughout the uh, InfoWars uh, area here. I heard her saying that and it was just deja vu all over again. It was Bill Clinton saying, I did not have text with those people. No textual relations here whatsoever. So she's saying, and again, parsing the semantics of all of this, I'm confident that I never sent or received any information that was classified at the time it was sent or received. What I think you're seeing here is very typical kind of discussion to some extent, disagreement among various parts of the government over what should or should not be publicly released. Well, she's got her own private server that she's keeping this on. Now, they found at least four emails from that private server account that she used while she was Secretary of State that had classified information on it. That's what the Inspector General Charles McCullough said. He, is over, he oversees intelligence agencies, and that's what he told members of Congress on a letter on Thursday. I see you have that clip of uh, Hillary Clinton ready. Yeah, let's play that clip of Clinton. I want you to hear the tone of her voice. First, I want to say a word about uh, what's uh, in the news today. And uh, it's because there have been a lot of inaccuracies as Congressman Cummings made clear this morning. Maybe the heat is getting to everybody. We all have a responsibility to get this right. I have released... Uh, yeah, we're going to come right back. We're going to talk about that. They said that Alex is going to have a special report. If you've seen the article uh, that's up on Infowars.com of the barbecue police coming around and telling people to uh, watch their smoke or they're going to have to report them, it's absolutely an amazing exchange you may find it hard to believe, but this is something that is happening everywhere. It's part of a much, much broader agenda. It's all tied into Agenda 21. Alex Jones has a special report we're going to air at the end of this hour that's going to broaden that out to put that in the proper context so you really understand that there's more than just some little petty bureaucrat here bullying somebody like a crossing guard at a elementary school. Okay, It's much more to that. Uh, and that's going to be in a special report at the end of this hour. Of course, this hour of Alex Jones' is, uh, show is going to be brought to you by 
Deep Cleanse. This is our newest flagship product, something we just got in at InfoWarsLife.com. Deep Cleanse is an all-in-one total body cleanser that uses nano colloidal zeolites. Think of those really kind of as um, kind of nano-sized sponges and organic ingredients to cleanse chemicals and toxic metals from the body. With all the toxic pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and metals in the food supply, Deep Cleanse is a great way for you to fight back. Get your body of Deep Cleanse at InfoWarsLife.com for the lowest prices while supplies last because uh, it seems like every time we get a new product in, it immediately sells out. And I don't know how much they've got left, but of course, right now through the end of July, there is free shipping at InfoWarsLife.com. We've already sold out about 85% of this first run. Uh, it'll be months before our next shipment arrives. That's just what they told me. So that's how much we sold out. We sold out about half of it the first day. Now it's up to about 85%. You can get that again at InfoWarsLife.com. That's our newest flagship product, Deep Cleanse. Now, just before we went to the break, we were talking about Hillary Clinton and her email problem. Uh, this is the inspector general who went through and did find that there were four emails that were classified. Now, the way Hillary is putting this in context, uh, she says, well, I turned over 55,000 pages of emails. OK, now they say that even though they've only found four and she's saying it's not really a big problem because if we just found four, the inspector general says that he's only reviewed about 40 of her emails. That puts a bit of a different spin on it, doesn't it? It may be 55,000 pages of emails, but they've only looked at 40 of them and they found that 10 percent of them contained information that was classified. Now, her defense is worthy of her husband. He says, I did not send or receive anything that was classified at the time. Like I said before, he did not, she did not have textual relationships with anybody. Look, let's put that in perspective as well with whistleblowers. Jesslyn Radick, who has defended uh, Ed Snowden, she defended many of the NSA whistleblowers like Thomas Drake and others. I, she might have been the lawyer for William Binney. She was a whistleblower herself. So she knows what's going on with the whistleblowers in terms of classification classified documents and otherwise, this is what she tweeted out. She says the uh, government says that Hillary Clinton's emails have classified data on it, but she says that the classified, that they were classified after the fact. Now, whistleblowers have been prosecuted in both scenarios, she points out. They've been prosecuted for releasing information that was classified before they released it. They have been prosecuted for information that was classified after they released it. That's what they did to Thomas Drake. They took some very innocuous documents that didn't need to be classified. They weren't classified when he took them. They found them. He wasn't even releasing them to anyone. They found them in his apartment and said, you are in possession of classified documents. Of course, that whole prosecution collapsed. But that is what the government did to whistleblowers. So, uh, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily put her off the hook. And right now, with 10% uh, of the emails that have been reviewed uh, showing that they were classified, uh, doesn't look too good for Hillary Clinton at this point. Although, I don't think it's really going to hurt her in terms of incarceration or in terms of charges brought against her. Because it appears that no matter what these people do, they never go to jail. Look at this article from Infowars.com today. Documents prove the IRS targeted conservative groups. This is a Judicial Watch showing that they went after the donor lists of tax-exempt organizations. They went after the people who had donated to these organizations, these conservative groups, and then they targeted them with audits. But let's put this in context because this is the way the uh, Daily Sheeple article points out. They say on Monday, this, last, this has all come out in the last week, last Monday we learned that the IRS phone system has hung up on 8.8 .8 million callers who were looking for help with their taxes. Look, they weren't just looking for advice because the IRS doesn't get advice. These are people who are calling up saying, why are you making these demands on me? I don't owe this money. I need clarification for what these demands are. And the IRS just hangs up on them. The IRS talks about how they have fired their Customer service representatives, if you want to call them customer service, that's a pretty cynical way to put it. But they have fired them to reduce costs, they say. Meanwhile, hiring 17,000 new IRS agents for Obamacare. That brings us to revelation number two last week. 
We also learned that the IRS has been levying outrageous fines on businesses that reimburse their employees for health insurance. Fines that are 12 times larger than the statutory limit written in the Affordable Care Act in Obamacare. Okay, so they, they put fines in Obamacare. And the IRS comes along and says, well, I don't think we need any stinking laws. We're just going to find people 12 times what the law says. See, it's not about revenue. It's always been about control. The IRS has been used by virtually every president against their political enemies. It's just never been used in such a broad sweep as has been done with Obama. It has never been done so openly, so brazenly. It's never been done without anybody trying to arrest someone for doing this. This is what Richard Nixon was impeached for. One of the main three things that he was impeached for was using the IRS against his political enemies, attempting to use it. You know what happened at that time? He sent a letter of enemies to the head of the IRS, and the head of the IRS blew the whistle on that. No, the IRS today works with Obama and goes after massive numbers of conservative groups, targeting them for auditing, targeting their donor list for audits. Now, this is what we learned from Judicial Watch this week. They have obtained documents that prove the IRS used donor lists of tax-exempt organizations to target them with audits. They were largely conservative organizations that were opposed to Obama. The IRS attempted to issue a gift tax of 35% on these donors, despite the fact that a gift tax on donations was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and hasn't been used since 1982. You understand? Think about that. This is something, first we learned last week that they go in and they impose fines on companies that are 12 times higher than the Obamacare Act allows. Just arbitrarily take it to 12 times higher. Then they go in and issue a gift tax of 35% on donors. This is something that's been declared unconstitutional. It hasn't been done since 1982. And they just do it. This is the kind of punitive corruption, the politicization of the IRS that is extremely dangerous. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to have a special report from Alex Jones in the next segment talking about what is behind these regulations to shut down your barbecue grill, your fireplace. Creating regulations in Seattle where they're going to outlaw single family homes. This is all part of a government agenda. Just like the war on drugs, many conservatives don't understand that the war on drugs is a UN agenda. It was something that was created 10 years before Nixon declared the war on drugs. The UN created their four schedules. And of course, we repeated that verbatim 10 years later. That's the way these things work. It's just the same way that they do the uh, legislative agendas where the corporations write the laws with ALEC, the American Legislative um, um, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but we've seen this happening in many places with toll roads. That's the way they used it in North Carolina just recently. We saw the politicians there working with ALEC, working with this organization. They come in, they go to these special retreats, and this organization hands them legislation that has been written by the corporations. And all they have to do is fill in the name of the state and get it passed in their state. And there's a lot of questions about the money that is being handed around the scene, being given by ALEC and these other organizations. And, of course, that's the way these massive trade treaties that are being negotiated in secret are being handled as well. They're being written by the corporate lawyers. Once they get that written, they're going to hand it to the legislators and just tell them to sign on the bottom line. We see this happening over and over again. But there's a massive concern and rightful concern about what's going on in immigration in this country. And Donald Trump's meteoric rise in the polls is re a reflection of that. We're seeing a situation. Look at some of these headlines. Illegal immigrant victims, mothers, we're at war right here in this country. Of course, we've seen the uh, many people, the parents going to these congressional hearings, talking about how their family members were killed by illegal immigrants who are basically part of a catch and release program that's been created by the federal government. Violent criminals who are not incarcerated, who are, even if they are deported, they are brought back in very quickly. 
illegal alien crime wave in Texas. 611,234 crimes, 2,993 murders. This is from 2008 to 2014. It includes thousands of homicides, sexual assaults. They say a total of 177,588 unique criminal alien defendants. These are people who had already been fingerprinted. I went to a meeting of the Secure Communities Initiative. This was the, uh, it wasn't really a meeting of that, but it was a meeting of the Democrat Party that was uh, angry. They wanted to get that uh, repealed here in the Austin area. They were angry with the county sheriff, who is a black Democrat. They told him, you're in the wrong party if you're going to enforce this Secure Communities Initiative. What that was done was to identify people who had previously been in the system as criminals, people they had fingerprints for, to single them out, to turn them over to immigration. They didn't want to see that happen. And so basically what it turns into is a catch and release program. Look at this. Obama administration plans more executive action on immigration. They say the Obama administration is moving forward with plans to expand a waiver program that will allow additional illegal aliens to remain in the country rather than apply, than apply for legal status from abroad. Another article, Obama shielding 80% of the nation's illegals from deportation. Another one, Obama administration strips requirement to defend the United States from the citizenship oath. One more, a mother of a son murdered by illegal aliens slams the sanctuary cities and politicians and says, your silence speaks volumes. So with all of this, with the silence of the Democrats, the people telling us it's not a problem, it's a good thing that we have open borders. Donald Trump comes in and states the obvious. It is a problem. It's a problem that the Republicans aren't doing anything about, the Democrats aren't doing anything about. What really is the problem? I mean, when you look at a massive influx of people that we don't have any control over, it's going to raise unemployment, it's going to lower wages, whether it's legal or illegal immigration, if we have no control over who comes through our borders and the number of people that come through our borders. Look at what just happened in Disney. They brought in Indian workers under a visa program that was originally set up so that tech companies could bring in people who had specialized skills that they couldn't find in the United States. But these were just customer service representatives. These were low-level, white-collar jobs. Nevertheless, they were able to get the Indian people that they brought in at a much cheaper rate than they could the Americans. They told the Americans, train your replacements, and then they fired them. See, what, what we don't understand is that every country, and we've mentioned this many times here at InfoWars. Alex has talked about it. You can't go to any other country and just say, I want to live here. I want to be provided for. I want to be given free health care. I want free education. I want housing. I want food stamps, whatever. You can't do that in any other country. I remember 20 plus years ago, I was looking at leaving this country. I was looking at Belize. I was looking at New Zealand. Even in Belize, I would have to go in with $25,000 per person to get citizenship there. Every other country, especially countries like Switzerland, you have to have a certain amount of wealth to provide for yourself, for your family. You have to show that you have income, show that you have a job, but not here, not in America, not under this situation. Now, I don't want to see some kind of a Berlin Wall erected at the borders. Because understand that in East Germany, that Berlin Wall was not there to stop people immigrating into East Germany. It was there to keep people from emigrating leaving that country. But we also have a situation here in America where immigrants, even illegal immigrants, are treated better than citizens. For example, in-state tuition. An American citizen can only get in-state tuition in the state in which they live. Not so with an alien. They can get in-state tuition anywhere. They get treated differently, as we pointed out, with the sanctuary cities, with the, the communities that don't want to participate in secure communities or whatever. They get this catch and release system. They're essentially treated as if they've got diplomatic immunity. Why can't U.S. citizens be treated at least as well as immigrants? Why can't we get equal protection under the law from our own government? Of course, they're not doing that. At the same time, we see uh, the government looking the other way with violent criminals who come into this, this country. They are lowering the hammer on us with every kind of regulation, with every kind of inspection, using the Border Patrol, not at the border, 
but hundreds of miles inside the country to harass people that are obviously not coming into the country illegally. So basically, Donald Trump kind of goes Howard Beale on this whole problem, okay? He goes to the window and he shouts, he's mad as hell and he's not going to take it anymore. And he's got a lot of people who are following him on that. But what is, what is the source of the problem? When we look at this video, and let's pull this up because this is an article, uh, again, at the end of the week, last week, we had the, uh, uh, the pictures that uh, Josh Owens and Joe Biggs took of the drug smugglers coming across the Rio Grande River. Uh, they got some very close-up pictures of them uh, dumping the large uh, packages into the back of the SUV. And they were there to cover Trump. So this is going on while Donald Trump is there. And so uh, Drudge picked up the story. And then uh, Donald Trump saw it from the Drudge Report. Here's what Donald Trump had to say. What happened? So while we're there, you probably read it. It was in Drudge. Who's great, by the way. Drudge is amazing. But the story in Drudge, and big story, it's all over the place now. Guys swimming across, and big bags of stuff, drugs, swimming across the river, right? Swimming right across. And they put the drugs, and actually the camera crew, or the reporters, were petrified because they thought they were going to be killed. Because they're showing this on camera. The guy's carrying bags of stuff. It was drugs. Yeah, exactly. That's a very dangerous situation. But let me ask you, what were they doing? Which direction were these drugs coming? They're being pulled in just like the crime is being pulled in because of our war on drugs. We've got businesses that are pulling in immigrants because they want cheap labor. We've got government pulling them in because they want reliable dependents, people who will vote for them. That's the way you stop it. You have to understand that it is the war on drugs that creates the El Chapos, just like it created Al Capone. Stay with us. Alex Jones has a special report on Agenda 21. We'll be right back. Many times in history, incredibly horrible things can happen. Corruption can get completely over the top, and the public just doesn't seem to respond. But then there can be a catalyst that really causes a mass awakening. And last year, that was Jonathan Gruber, one of the architects of Obamacare, on C-SPAN admitting that they keep the public in the dark and lie to us and that the insurance companies wrote Obamacare to screw everybody. And that's when it went from being 65% unpopular to like 89% in major polls. But even though it's almost 90% unpopular and totally illegal, and even though insurance profits are up 40-something percent just in the last few years of Obamacare, still the class warfare crowd can't get they've been screwed. It wasn't a free deal. The hospital systems are collapsing. Corporate raiders are looting the people under standardized central global models that have already been deployed in other countries. I'm about to get to some huge information. But I just want to point out, so folks understand there's a chance to stop the next phase of this, and that's Agenda 21, that's what all of this is, it's just a global treaty for global standardization of zoning, education, environment, health care, self-defense, reproductive rights, trade. That's what TPP is, it's just the next extension of that. A usurpation, private corporations setting up a world government. We're being conquered by banks, not tanks. That back in 2007, I produced the film Endgame, Blueprint for Global Enslavement. And in that documentary, we show you what's going to happen in the next decade. And now we're here, six and a half, seven, actually almost eight years later, time flies. So 2007 to 2015, we're talking eight years. Countless people will hate the new world order and will die protesting against it. So this has been going on for a long time, but now they have to break our will, they have to train us to basically accept anything and everything. Now there's a new video out. As I was saying earlier, sometimes there's something political that happens that really gets people's attention. And what's really woken folks up in the last 12 months across the United States is something we warned of back in 2007, 2008, and it's in the film Endgame, is that under UNESCO UN law, that we've signed on to, so they have to bring us under it. All fireplaces, space heaters, everything's gonna be banned. Here's a clip from Reuters back in 2008 announcing how wonderful it was that the EU was banning space heaters and fireplaces. 
The war on climate change is brewing conflict in Europe. It's over EU plans to ban these outdoor patio heaters. Okay, there you go. Boom, that's now happened. Now, let's move on along to 2015, the thing that's gotten people's attention. Not just this particular story, but from San Francisco to Tampa, Florida, uh, from Austin, Texas, uh, to Detroit, Michigan. They are coming in saying no more fireplaces, no more space eaters, and they've got little regulators out with these vaguely written international rules that they pass locally that are mere copies saying anything anybody finds objectionable, we're going to give you a fine for. And this video is in Florida and has gone viral at Infowars.com where the code enforcer shows up. They're barbecuing. Literally, you can't even see the smoke. The neighbor complains about it, and we now have that in Austin, Texas as well, and he comes and gives them a fine. And he says, hey, everybody else is cooking out. And he said, look, just complain on her. So the answer is just all tattle on each other. We have GMO poisoning us, 400 billion tons of glyphosate a year. Hard to believe number, but that's how much is dumped on things. All of this is killing us, but let's worry about barbecue smoke. This is the whole nanny state, and then it gives power to people to complain. This is all part of the rollout for this. And this code enforcer says, hey, if it's objectionable to anybody around here, it's banned. You can have smells on your property, but not off your property. So again, they're just training you to live under total tyranny. Here's the clip. Smell again right now, but okay. I'm on your property. You're allowed to have smells on your property, so that doesn't count. Okay. But when I'm on the street, oh that's my goodness, so you yeah. can't smell barbecue smoke on the street. <laughs> I can't smell barbecue smoke. I'm suggesting oh right goodness, now. Man. Is that against the law? The law says. Do you want me to read it again? Can everybody around here cook out? Why I, 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 always, all I can tell you is. is Notice he says, all I can tell you, then he reads it. Anything objectionable, that's under the UN. Your speech is objectionable, it's banned. Now, big chemical plants can spew chemicals in the air on you, that's fine. It's all for the little people to have no rights. And then it just continues on from there. Florida man ordered by city to keep barbecue smell from leaving his property. Now, let's move on to the next story. This is from a few years ago. Micro apartments. Bloomberg himself is behind getting people to live in 250 to 300 to 400 square foot apartments so they can raise taxes on you, have higher property taxes, and have most of your living expense not be to actual square feet or quality, but be to pay government more taxes. So everything's being geared to basically take everything you've got but tell you it's trendy so it's cool. This is all part of Agenda 21. California wages war on single-family homes. In recent years, homeowners have been made to feel a bit like villains rather than the victims of hard times. Wall Street, sh and then it just goes on from there that you're not allowed to have a family home. And, and they tell you all these reasons for it. It's under the UN code to have us be in compact cities for higher taxes and to end uh, family units as you know it in these new high-rise tattletale buildings. Continuing, this is just this week, how a Seattle plan to end single-family zoning could change affordable housing. EPA's wood-burning stove ban has chilling consequences for many rural people. And then it ties into the social engineering. Obama just goes to Kenya a few days ago and he lectures them on gay rights. While they have terrorists connected to groups he's funding attacking their country, he lectures them as if that's the only right there is, the only culture there is. No other culture is allowed but the artificial culture of, quote, gay rights, because then you don't have children, then you don't have families, then it lowers population. We cover that in Endgame and, and show their documents where they admit that's the plan to end the human community as we know it. I'm not against people that are, quote, gay. I can care less. I'm a libertarian. It's that this agenda is in stone to force feed this, not for tolerance, but to make everyone adopt it. And finally, California governor signs a bill repealing words husband and wife. And they're now saying it's hateful uh, for children to use the word boy or girl. So in public schools nationwide under Agenda 21's control of education, you're called purple penguins. Imagine a Kurt Vonnegut novel where you don't call yourselves boys or girls, you're purple penguins. It's, it, it's a total cult of absolute brainwashing and control over the top at a level absolutely never seen. And then they say brown paper bags in Seattle, it's the model of the country, are racist and hateful. Well, now they're saying medieval themed video games legitimize white supremacy. So any movie or video game set in a white culture 
is obviously bad. It's not allowed to even exist. It's not, King Arthur's racist because where are the black people? Well, then I guess where are the where are the white people in you know in, in, in an African fable? It's where you don't know reading, writing, and arithmetic. You just know mental illness to obsess on any culture that's independent, any culture not controlled by the corporate plastic hive Borg. And, and, and you notice it's getting worse every few weeks now. This is the global rollout all over the world. This is Agenda 21. This is the green police where they had Audi commercials five years ago where you get arrested for having the wrong light bulbs. They even admitted in the San Francisco Chronicle that that was meant to prepare the public for the real rollout. Of it. And now federally and locally, they wear the exact uniforms from the green police ads that Audi ran during the Super Bowl five years ago. That's now happened. This is how they condition and prepare you. It's a diabolical takeover plan. We're breaking it down here on the Sunday transmission. David and I will have more info on this, and I'll be reporting live later today from England, where we're going to show the epicenter of the banking takeover uh, is emanating out from the city of London within London to Spain, to Italy, and to Greece. And I'll be live all this week with David with reports from Europe because the contagion is in Europe. They're saying as the EU collapses, they want to form a super EU. The answer is to get rid of whatever sovereignty was left, raise taxes on the people, get rid of their uh, chicken feed, get rid of their entitlements. See, in the final phase, all your goodies will be taken, all your welfare will be taken, all your pension funds you earned will be taken, and all you're going to get is black uniforms and surveillance. Europe is ahead of us in this global New World Order takeover with a culture and a religion of green police tyranny, banning barbecues, banning space heaters, banning outdoor heaters, banning the word mom and dad, boy and girl. I mean, if this isn't a cult, I don't know what is. Again, I'm Alex Jones reporting for InfoWars.com, back to David Knight and the Sunday Worldwide Transmission. And again, as Alex just said, the way that you're going to stop this is if you know what's coming. That's why the House has just passed the Dark Act, as activists call it, hiding what is in our food, prohibiting states from passing laws to let us know what's in our food. Stay with us. We're going to talk about that and other issues. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show on this Sunday, July 26, 2015. I'm David Knight, your host. I want to talk in this section about the amazing dichotomy that we've seen in just the last week or so in the Congress. We've had the House pass a bill that would block states from requiring GMO labeling on food. Now, there's already two states that have uh, passed that law, and this would essentially override those bills. I see a big constitutional problem with it. Of course, it's not become law yet. It still has to go through the Senate 275 to 150, they passed the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act of 2015. How is it accurate when they prohibit you from knowing everything that's in your food? There's over 3,000 ingredients that are required to be labeled by the FDA if somebody puts a, a particular ingredient. They have a list of 3,000 of them. If that ingredient is on that list that's on the, from the FDA, you have to say that that ingredient is in your food. Of course, they're saying you're not going to be able to afford to eat if we have to change these labels. <laughs> really, is that really credible? That is something that we've seen coming out of the Coalition for Safe and Affordable Food. They uh, said that this is going to increase $500 a year, your food cost, if these labels were to go through. And of course, as um, Blacklisted News points out, this is a lie that's been debunked over and over again. This is something that came out from the Council for Biotech Information, uh, Monsanto, and the other uh, trade organizations that create uh, genetically modified organisms are part of that. Look, we have a lot of different ingredients, like I just said, that are on uh, listed on your food. You're free to look at that. You're free to consider those ingredients. You're free to ignore them. You're free to just blissfully choose it because you like the color of the label and you don't care at all what's in it. We have the thing called free choice, especially in grocery stores. But there are people who want to know, people who are very concerned. And we all, as consumers, have a right to know. The principle is called informed consent. But, of course, that's something they don't really care about much anymore, is it? When you've got state governments like California telling people that we're going to mandate, uh, that we're going to mandate vaccines for you, for your children, and we don't really care whether you agree with this or not, we're not going to uh, uh, let you be informed about this, and we certainly don't care about your consent. And that's precisely what we're seeing here. 
As I've said before, we've seen the corporate model getting control of politicians and government so that they could create regulations for their smaller competitors to drive them out of business. That's been the anti-competitive model for a very long time. It's been a huge part of crony capitalism. I mean, you can see it even in the banking industry. Look at the act that was put together by Dodd and Frank. The Dodd-Frank bill basically created so many regulatory requirements that small banks everywhere are having to stop or cannot any longer write loans about homes or uh, many business loans are having to get out of that business because they can't afford to comply with the massive amounts of uh, regulation, reporting, and forms that are required by this so-called Reform Act. So once they get out, once they no longer have the competition from the smaller banks or whatever the industry is, then the big guys who got the legislation put in there to start with can come back and they can get that regulation removed so it no longer costs them any money. That's been the model for a very long time. But now the model is to keep you in the dark, to not let you know what the new trade treaties are about, to not let you know what's going in your food, and to tell you that even if you do know, you're going to be forced to get that. You're going to be forced to buy the insurance. You're going to be forced to buy affordable health care, just like you're going to be forced to buy food that doesn't have accurate food labeling information on it. They call it the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act when they deny states requiring that they accurately label what's on there. That's the pattern. That's the pattern we've seen from our government for a very long time. That's why activists are calling it the Dark Act. But now the pattern is for the corporations to use government to hold a gun to your head to force you to buy products that you don't want, that aren't safe, that you can't afford. Stay with us. We're going to be right back, and we're going to kind of talk about what's going on on the intelligence side, something that ties into Jade Helm. This segment of The Alex Jones Show is brought to you by Survival Shield X2. That's our super high-quality nascent iodine formulation. It is now back in stock. Survival Shield X2 is, however, still available in limited quantity, so get it while you can. Stock up on it while we have our free shipping through the end of July. You'll find that at InfoWarsLife.com. We've barely been able to meet supply, and this emergency shipment that we've got in is not going to last much longer. And again, as I mentioned, you can get free shipping right now, so it's a good time for you to stock up. Check out the hundreds of five-star reviews. See why 98% of listeners would recommend Survival Shield X2 at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Now, as we were talking about in the uh, last segment, we were talking about the DARK Act. Uh, of course, they call it the safe and accurate food labeling when they deny you to have information about what's going into your food, when they override the constitutional authority that the states have to require labeling. This is for products that are within their state, and they're certainly within their right to uh, put in laws that require that uh, the uh, manufacturers will tell people what is in their food, and it's been passed in a couple of states. So what they decided to do was to fight that at the national level. And, of course, it's going to be fought at the international level. That's a huge part of the secret trade agreements, the transatlantic, the transpacific trade agreements. Those are also going to shut down uh, the idea that anyone should know if there's genetically modified organisms in their food. Why should we be concerned about that? Well, you need to understand what genetically modified organisms are, educate yourself, but we should all have the ability and the right to know what is in our food. And we should all be very concerned about genetic modified organisms, what we have already seen uh, from these organisms in terms of studies from uh, other countries. We saw the study in France where they showed the uh, rats, the mice with tumors all over their bodies, just feeding them uh, genetically modified food for a short period of time. That study was redone by Monsanto, and they shortened it up to an extremely short period of time and said, look, our mice didn't get those tumors because they ran it a fraction of the time that the French study did. So you can always find somebody that you can pay to do a study to uh, prove that your product is safe, but we have a right to know what is in our food, but not when you've got the government that is for sale, not when you have congressmen who can easily be bought off 
by Monsanto, by the Koch brothers. Again, uh, one of these articles has pointed out that Koch brothers uh, only had to pay $299,000 to block labeling of genetically modified food. That's an article from Zero Hedge. Uh, they point out that uh, the guy who took, they have one particular congressman, just like uh, Senator Pan in California took the lead for pushing through the mandatory vaccinations of children there. Uh, the guy that's doing this to push through uh, genetically modified uh, foods without anybody knowing what's in it is a guy by the name of Mike Pompeo from Kansas, a Republican. And uh, it didn't cost them too much to get this through. They have paid $67 million to fight labeling laws all across this country at the state level. Uh, but even places where it has been won now, they decide they would go the next higher, next higher level and shut this down. Now, you have to ask yourself when you see this, when you see that you're not going to be allowed to know what's in your food, it's very interesting to see this in direct contravention to what the government wants to know about you, which is everything. And we can see this with another bill that unanimously passed committee. This is a bill that would allow Homeland Security to create yet another department. This one, I guess we could call this the pre-crime department. This is uh, going to be the Countering Violent Extremism Department, the CVE. It is going to be funded under FEMA, which, of course, is under Homeland Security. Very worrying when you look at the fact that this new department is going to be identifying people who have the potential to be violent extremists. They haven't committed an act. This is equivalent to identifying people, as we've pointed out before with Jade Helm, human domain analytics, activity-based intelligence, geospatial intelligence, all these different technologies that will mine all of the information that they're getting about everyone, about every group, putting this together then running it through their artificial intelligence to see who pops up out of their database. A very, very dangerous idea, if ever there was one. Many people have been concerned about the potential of profiling to falsely identify people of different groups. Understand that this is about religious groups, it's about political groups, it's about racial groups, this is about every kind of profiling you can imagine. And this is also involved with Jade Helm. Mastering the human domain is their motto. That was the motto of the Geospatial Intelligence Conference just a couple of years ago. The keynote speech was about mastering the human domain. Now they want to take this to another level. They want to fund this under FEMA. And that comes at the same time we've heard Wesley Clark floating the trial balloon saying that we need to uh, identify people who are going to be maybe looking at social media, looking at young people who are alienated because of their job, because of their love life, maybe because they're just not happy. We need to look at their religious background. Remember when he said all that? We covered this last week. You need to understand where this is going because at the same time that came out, we see this bill that passed the House committee unanimously and is now going to the full House. This will fund efforts by FEMA to identify people to propagandize people. This is an all-out propaganda campaign. Remember, it was just a couple of years ago that our government removed the prohibitions from uh, Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. They were never allowed to operate in the United States. That was the term of their creation. They were not going to be allowed to propagandize the American people on behalf of the government. But of course, we had things like NPR. <laughs> we had things like ABC, CBS, uh, NBC. People who would, when Obama was pushing through Obamacare, they would report every day. Remember how they did that? Every day from the White House. And when the Republicans said, hey, we would like to have some equal time to push back against what Obama is promoting with Obamacare. They said, no, we're not going to give you equal time. They said, fine, sell us some equal time. They said, we're not even going to sell you equal time. So, yeah, there's been a lot of propaganda, but now it is getting much more in your face. I mean, this is getting to the point of Orwell's Ministry of Truth. They're now creating this new department under Homeland Security, under FEMA, called Countering Violent Extremism. They're going to identify people through social media, through other methods that they think might become radicalized and violent. And then they are going to... Uh, who knows what they're going to do? Perhaps they're going to inter them. That's certainly what Wesley Clark proposed. Remember, he said at the time, he said, if 
in World War II, someone supported the Nazis at the expense of the U.S., we didn't say that was freedom of speech. We put them in a camp. No, actually, you were locking people up because of the group that they belonged to, because they were Japanese Americans. It wasn't that they were speaking out in favor of the Nazis. They didn't lock up Charles Lindbergh. They didn't lock up the royal family for speaking out in favor of eugenicism or the Aryan race or saying that Hitler made the trains run on time. They didn't lock people up for that. They locked people up because they were German, because they were Japanese ancestry. Of course, spies were always locked up. People who created uh, acts of terrorism, of violence, of sabotage, they were always locked up. They were executed. But this is something different. And Wesley Clark knows that this is different. Wesley Clark was valedictorian at West Point. This is a guy that ran for president as a Democrat. He knows better than this, okay? He goes on to say, people who are disloyal to the United States, as a matter of principle, that's fine. It's their right, but it's our right and obligation to segregate them from the community for the duration of the conflict. Let's parse those euphemisms there. Segregate means internment. The length of the conflict is indefinite. This is a war on terrorism. It is a war on a tactic. There's not even a defined group of people. You may think you know who this is. You may think that this is against the jihadis. It's not against the jihadis. We'll talk about that when we come back. But understand, too, look at this in the context of the NDAA that they passed a couple of years ago, that Obama signed on New Year's Eve. Indefinite detention by the military, without trial, without charge. And now they've got FEMA involved, and they've got a U.S. general pushing the idea. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to take your calls later in this hour. The number on Sunday is a little bit different. It's uh, 877-789-2539. That's 877-789-ALEX if you want to call in and talk about the topics we've been talking about today. I want to go back, though, and, and continue to talk a little bit more about this bill. It is uh, H.R. 2889 is the uh, bill that will create a uh, center for violent extremism to combat violent extremism. And, of course... That is not uh, people who have committed acts of violence, but people that they identify as potentially becoming radicalized, potentially becoming violent. Who would that be? Well, of course, it reminds me of every election when the Democrats and the Republicans uh, say that they're going to uh, cut somebody's benefit or they're going to raise somebody's taxes. Everybody believes that it's going to be a different group than them. They don't think that they're going to get their benefits cut or their taxes raised. They think it's going to be someone else. And that's kind of the same thing we see happening with this. Everybody here is violent extremists, and uh, so many people want to believe, well, okay, that's the jihadis. That's people like uh, that guy that shot up the recruitment stations. Did you notice how they push back against that? Do you notice how they refuse to label him as a terrorist? Did you notice that they came up with every excuse they could to avoid the connections of Mohammed and a guy who was very troubled? You could see his... Um, if you want to look and mine the database uh, on social media, you could uh, very easily do that and see that he had a chip on his shoulder about the way that he was treated. He was very angry. He specifically targeted not one, but two different recruitment areas, shooting at the people at one, then driving to another one and shooting them, specifically targeting the U.S. military. But of course, we can't say it was an act of terrorism. We can't say it was uh, an Islamic jihadi who did this in spite of all of the obvious indicators. They have to come up with some phony baloney thing that his parents were concerned that he was doing a lot of drugs and uh, uh, prescription drugs, uh, marijuana, and alcohol. Look, the marijuana and alcohol aren't going to make you do that. He knew precisely what he was doing. It wasn't that he went crazy and just started shooting randomly in some area because he was hyped up on uh, some SSRI drug. He could have been hyped up on that, but it was also focused on uh, a jihadi agenda. So, but a lot of people look at this and they say, well, of course, uh, you know, violent extremists, yeah, we need to stop that. We need to keep things like that from happening in the future. Understand that is not the way Mike McCall and Barack Obama are going to use this legislation. And this legislation has passed unanimously in the House Committee. It is now going to go to the full House and it has broad bipartisan support. Here's an article from Conservative HQ talking about this. They say, who are these violent extremists that Obama and Mike McCall, Republican, keep talking about? Well, are they actually Islamists? 
Okay, like the guy that shot things up in Tennessee? No. They're Americans, uh, perhaps, who support the right to life or Second Amendment rights, or maybe they're veterans. You know, the same people that we've seen over and over again from the Mayak Report, that InfoWars broke back in 2009, identifying people like uh, those who have bumper stickers supporting Ron Paul or Chuck Baldwin uh, on the back of their car. Those are the people that they're concerned about. Those are the people that the Southern Poverty Law Center has identified, okay? Remember, of course, that uh, you know, they, they want to talk about white supremacists and the Ku Klux Klan. The Southern Poverty Law Center's founder, Morris Dees, defended the Ku Klux Klan. He worked for George Wallace in the early days of the civil rights movement when George Wallace was opposed to civil rights. The only way that, that Morris Dees, the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, was involved in the civil rights movement when it was happening was to defend the Klan. To defend the people that beat demonstrators, that burned their buses. He made a lot of money doing that, but he made even more money doing direct mail. And that's what they're doing. They're setting the agenda. And we've seen this over and over again, not just in the Mayak report. We've seen it in scenarios, military scenarios floated by uh, the government. We've also uh, seen it in uh, the various reports that are coming from them. Here's another example from Security Debrief. This guy says, uh, McCall's legislation must take on a more nuanced, thoughtful, and intelligent perspective of homegrown violent extremism than we have seen thus far in government efforts. He says, this is not just about ISIL or about those inspired by radical, violent interpretation of Islam. If we're serious about countering growth in homegrown violent extremism, we need to legitimately focus our efforts on all forms of it. Okay, so then he talks about a few different points down here. He says, here's the problems with our approach so far. Number one, the whole idea of radicalism. We don't really define what radicalism is. And I say, yeah, that's, that is a problem because it's so open-ended, just like the war on terrors, a war on a tactic. But they want to broaden it. The very next thing they say, it's too narrowly focused on Muslims. The original program looked exclusively at the Muslim community. So we need to look at other things. To be sure, Muslim identity extremism is a threat. But it is not the only threat, nor is it even the greatest threat. This is what the people in the business are saying. This is what the people in the military industrial complex, this is what the people in the surveillance industrial complex are telling us. Okay, This is what the people who write the war scenarios, who write the legislation, this is what they think. Over and over again. We see this. We see this from Stratfor where he's talking about, he says, yeah, okay, Islamicism, that's a, that, that's a threat, but it's not the biggest threat. Okay, all these people have a bigger threat. The bigger threat, the homegrown threat, are people who are conservatives, who are for limited government. As they would call them, this is what he says right here in the, uh, in the study here. And of course, he's quoting government studies when he says this. In 2014, a national consortium for the study of terrorism and responses to terrorism, uh, their center reported that it is anti-government sovereign citizen movement that is the top terrorist threat. The New America Foundation, remember those guys? They called for a North American Union ID. That was their editorial not too long ago. They were in uh, the, the top of uh, CNN calling for a North American Union ID. Well, these people also like to play with statistics. They say, if we exclude the September 11, 2001 attack, well, why in the world would you exclude that? Ah, because it doesn't give you the answer that you want. Okay, but if you exclude that, we see that more people have been killed by anti-government adherents, white supremacists, other non-Muslim extremists. So just understand that when they're talking about combating violent extremism, when they're talking about creating a department that's going to be under FEMA to identify, to propagandize, and we can presume that they're going to inter people just as Wesley Clark has advocated with his trial balloons. When you look at that, just understand that they're talking probably about you, anyone whether you're Islamic or whether you're not Islamic, whether you're white or whether you're not white, anyone can be flagged as a false positive by some kind of a massive pre-crime automated system. You understand how this is going to work. They're going to put everybody's data in there, just as they've said with geospatial intelligence. They're going to have the Jade Helm people, the special forces, as Admiral McRaven said, we want to be boots on the ground for the NSA. Okay, that's what they're doing right now. They're practicing domestic operations. People say it's provocative when uh, 
when the Russians are doing exercises or when the Americans are going close to the Russian border and doing exercises as they, as they currently are right now. They're doing exercises for a much smaller period of time with a much smaller number of people. And people are saying, well, that's very provocative. You're, you're trying to provoke the Russians. Okay. But we don't think that it's provocative when they train against U.S. civilians in our country labeling us as hostile? Stay with us. We'll take your phone calls. 877-789-2539. I'll let you know that this hour of the Alex Jones Show is brought to you by ProPure Water Filters. You'll find them at InfoWarsStore.com with all the contaminants that you find in the water supply, things like fluoride, mercury, pharmaceutical residue, other toxic substances. You're crazy if you're not filtering your water. Even glyphosate. If you live in a rural area, you're going to get a lot of glyphosate coming down into your well. InfoWarsStore.com has the most effective, the most affordable ProPure filters out there, from travel filters to family-sized options. Our latest ProPure G2 filters remove pathogenic bacteria, fluoride, glyphosate, and more. The filter does it all. There's no need to buy extra filters just to take out something like fluoride. Visit InfoWarsStore.com. Start filtering your water supply today. That's InfoWarsStore.com. Now, just before I go to your calls, I, I wanted to continue because there was another article that, that really ties in to what we were just talking about with the massive data mining, with the pre-crime analysis. All of this data that they're collecting to, from you, remember, they're going to mine this data. They're going to pass it through some software that is going to try to identify people who are potential radicals, people who are potentially violent. And they're going to do something to those people before they commit a crime. That is the stated goal. That is the goal of this legislation from Mike McCall. Are they going to stop at propagandizing these people? Or are they going to proceed to detention in internment camps or worse? That's the question. But look, it doesn't even begin when you get on social media. It begins in kindergarten in today's America. This is a story from Zero Hedge. Pre-crime is now upon us. Schools assess students' threat level starting in kindergarten. This is in Virginia. The Virginia Student Threat Assessment Guidelines, VSTAG, they got a great, isn't that great? You know, it just legitimizes it when you create an acronym like that, VSTAG. VSTAG is a school-based, manualized process designed to help school administrators, mental health staff, this is for kindergarten, mental health staff in kindergarten, and law enforcement officers assess and respond to threat incidents involving students in kindergarten through 12th grade to prevent student violence. So we've got mental assessment, we've got law enforcement assessment from our kids beginning in kindergarten. And as he points out in Zero Hedge, he says the idea, unfortunately, is to implement this watch and flag surveillance grid. That's what uh, we see with the human domain analytics uh, to implement the surveillance grid across the system at every level with every institution that everyone comes in contact with. Constant surveillance everywhere. Of course, Zbigniew Brzezinski suggested that 40 some odd years ago in the book that got him to be handpicked for the Trilateral Commission uh, to head that commission as its first president by uh, Kissinger and others. Uh, the commission that would create a structure that we see uh, being mirrored in the current secretive trade treaties, the transatlantic, the trans-Pacific partnerships, uh, combining those two regions with the North American region. Nevertheless, the question is, you know, who's going to pop up? What's the criteria that they're going to use? But look at this. Look at this article. It's up on InfoWars.com today. At an anti-bullying conference, middle schoolers learn about lesbian strap-on anal sex and fake testicles. This is originally from the Daily Caller. They say in a small rural town in Iowa, a group of parents and community leaders are seeking to prevent students from the local taxpayer-funded middle school and high school from attending future versions of an anti-bullying conference for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender teens. Now, this is being held in a very small town, Humboldt, Iowa. This is a town with 4,690 people in it. And these are middle school kids. Look, this is nothing but Brave New World. Now, when I was in high school, we read Brave New World. We analyzed Brave New World. Now you've got middle schoolers living 
brave new world. That's what this is really about. Listen to some of the stuff that they're doing. How to sew fake testicles into your underwear in order to pass themselves off as boys. That's for girls. One speaker wore a dress made out of condoms, which could be, quote, used as needed. Another speaker raised the important middle school issue of using the Internet to locate an orgy. This is for middle school kids, okay? What kind of bullying is this? This is bullying from the LGBT community. This is sexual bullying from that community. We had bullying. Everybody had bullying in school. It wasn't anything to do with this. That's the pretext that they use to get these kids in to sexualize them. And they say, well, we support all clubs in the school that meet policies and procedures. But of course, I don't imagine that that policy and procedure, I don't imagine they would support some explicitly Christian group because they would be afraid they'd get sued by the ACLU. Let's go to your calls. Uh, Eileen in FEMA region number five. Uh, Eileen, are you a potential radical? <laughs> oh, she did. Okay. Uh, she dropped off. Let's go to uh, Tony in South Carolina. Tony. Hello, Tony. Hey, are you there? Hey. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, we're calling about the Sam Bland death. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, five, six years ago, I was studying, uh, you know, Mises.org about Austrian economics. <clears throat> I watched videos by Dr. Block. Um, and they brought up about, you know, whenever the government prohibits something, it makes it scarce, which makes it expensive. Um, and they're talking about marijuana. So I studied marijuana. You know, I don't smoke. I don't, you know, have anything to do with it. <clears throat> but during my studies, I found out that the marijuana plant has flowers and, and, and leaves. There are things called trichomes, which are little round balls that grow on those leaves at, at blossoming time. Inside that bulb, or the trichome, is tetrahydrocannabinol. But in its native form, the tetrahydrocannabinol is bonded or bound with a carboxylate molecule. To, um, to your, your body has receptors that receive THC. That's right. Yeah, there's a lot of people have talked about the health benefits of things like cannab cannabis oil and other things like that. We had a uh, representative here in the state of Texas, uh, David Simpson, who floated a bill and said, look, marijuana is a natural substance. We don't need to have any regulation of it any more than we need to have regulation of potatoes, for example. Uh, we should remove all mention of it from the code. I think, uh, Tony, the, the, the problem, you, you mentioned Austrian economics, and of course the economics of prohibition, you understand that as well. I think when we see places where they have decriminalized marijuana, they haven't really decriminalized it. What they've done is they've put in a very complicated code, very much like the IRS code that we talked about earlier in the show, where they can go in with a complex law and use that to entrap people. You know, one of the things that we've heard for a very long time is that any law that is sufficiently complex is the same as having no law at all, just as we see with the IRS constantly. We see that it is so complex, as uh, Rand Paul was uh, setting fire to it, trying to cut it with a chainsaw, with a wood chipper and everything. He's talking about, look, it's 70,000 pages. It's like, who can know what is in this code? It is simply an instrument of social control. It's not about revenue. It's simply about controlling you. But what was the point that you wanted to make with uh, Sandra Bland? Well, the, the point was, I was getting to it or wrapping it up so people understood it, is that the carboxyl atom blocks the THC receptor from receiving the THC. So without removing that carboxyl atom by converting it, you don't get high. You don't get stoned. You don't get you know, weak or madness. You don't go crazy. Um, you can remove that carboxyl by heat of 170, some odd or 180 degrees and up. You can remove it by oil and alcohol. Uh, so how did this... I mean, so, so do you buy the idea that uh, she got reefer madness and killed herself? Because we're running out of time. We've got to go to break. Um, yes yes or no? Very, very quickly. Well, we're out, out of time. Hang on. We'll, we'll, we'll come to you when we come back. Hang on. Stay on the line. I want to try to get to as many of these phone calls as we got on the line right now. I want to go back to uh, Tony in South Carolina. We were talking about Sandra Bland and uh, the likelihood as to whether or not the reason she committed suicide, as the police say that she did, was because she was on reefer madness. Real quickly, Tony, because we got a lot of people on online, I want to get to everybody. Uh, tell us what you think about Sandra Bland. Do you buy the uh, the line from the police that she w committed suicide because of marijuana when she was there in the jail for three days? Well, Dave, I'm, a, I'm very skeptical about it because you can eat 15 pounds of marijuana and not get a buzz. Yeah. So that wouldn't make her go nuts and kill herself. Mm -hmm. So. 
the autopsy shows that she consumed it, where did she get it from? In either case, yes. they wouldn't have gotten her high and stupid. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. It does, it's, it's not the sort of thing that makes people, I, I'm not like you, I'm not a marijuana user, but I've, I've read enough about it, talked to enough people about it that I know that it doesn't make you suicidal. It doesn't make you go out and shoot people. Uh, it is not reasonable. And the fact that she was there for three days and they say she was smoking it in such quantities that she committed suicide. I mean, that's just that really raises a lot of red flags. Uh, thank you, Tony. I want to go to some of the other callers because we've got a lot of people on the line. Let's go to uh, Chris in New York. Chris, you had some comments about Wesley Clark's comments. Yeah, um, thank you, David. I wanted to say that um, this, um, what he said about people that have to be somehow um, restrained, from, uh, taken away from the public, um, that sounds to me like the manual that was led out by the Army, which is the 3-39-40, the internment and resettlement. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We've seen this floated in so many different ways, so many different times. I mean, I, I can't believe that it's not getting more attention. I find this very alarming when you look at the manual you just talked about, when we look at the training scenarios that we've seen, when we look at the indefinite detention by the military without trial that was quietly signed in as part of the NDA Act that uh, never was repealed. They keep re-upping that. Uh, does that concern you? <laughs> it should. Well, it's, of course it is concerning, but people have to connect the dots. The NDAA is there for a reason. Also, the uh, manual that we just spoke about. Also, um, the Department of Homeland Security is saying that veterans are the number one threat, and mm -hmm. Christians are the number one, for, uh, the number four threat. Yes. Uh, also, I would like to state that um, the same type of scenario is being used for those who are who have political dissent and question the government and do not submit entirely to the establishment. And those are going to be the people who are sick that Watson is going to make the decision whether they take the care or not. They're starting this with the veterans, but that's going to be for everybody. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things, uh, Chris, that, that concerned me when I looked at this, and one, one of the places that I saw this uh, originally reported was on a site called Crooks and Liars. And they had a left-leaning Democrat Party readership. And what they said was, yeah, you know, I think this is basically a good idea. I think we ought to uh, inter all these people in Texas who uh, want their guns. Maybe we could send them someplace uh, uh, like Texas, anybody that's like that. Build a fence around Texas. You can read about these wackos at InfoWars. This is precisely the kind of thinking that is so dangerous. Everybody thinks it's going to be some other group. The conservatives thinks it's, think it's going to be the Islamicists, the, uh, uh, the liberals are obviously have their eye on us, but they need to realize that whenever there have been military fascist governments, they have usually been right wing and they may find themselves as targets and most likely will. This is going to be something that's going to be equal opportunity to anybody that the current regime, whether it's left wing or whether it's right wing, is going to see as dangerous. And that's what we need to stand together. This is something that should not separate us into different partisan groups. Everybody should understand that regardless of their political party, regardless of their religion or their race, this is something that threatens all of us to have a government doing this kind of pre-crime analysis. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris. We've got a phone call from Alex Jones, and I want to get his comments. Thank you, Alex. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Uh... I think we just lost him. Alex is trying to call us. He is he's touched down. He's in Europe right now. He's in uh, London. Did he did he drop off, guys? Okay, I think we lost the connection to Alex. If we can get him back, we're going to go back to Alex. Obviously, let's go to uh, Rob in Arizona. You wanted to talk about the IRS targeting? Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, David. I I got a big problem with that targeting. I mean, number one, it's unconstitutional to target any one singular group of people. Mm -hmm. racially, religiously, politically, or otherwise. And frankly, if they want to target somebody, how about they target themselves? Look at all the criminality they commit. Yes. Yes, precisely. I find it very concerning that this is so much broader in scope than anything we saw under Nixon, and at least they tried to impeach Nixon. Uh, he resigned because he knew that that was imminent. He knew that even his own party was going to impeach him for these criminal acts. And yet today... 
We don't even have the Republicans trying, and we know that the Democrats wouldn't impeach the Obama administration. And of course, they are ultimately responsible when the IRS underneath them does these types of things, when it's brought to light and they don't prosecute, they own those crimes. The Justice Department owns those crimes if they decide not to bring prosecution against that. Well, one of the things I thought was interesting that I found out recently and didn't know, but back in the 1930s, the IRS, when it was created, it was created as a corporation in the Philippines. Hmm. Yeah, I hadn't heard that before. Well, the, the simple fact of the matter is that if you look at the amount of money that comes from our income taxes, that does not run the government. It basically pays the interest on the debt. We are essentially on an interest-only loan from the Federal Reserve. It was created about the same time as the Federal Reserve. So we're basically on an interest-only loan. It's a balloon note, and it's going to turn out just like we saw happen in Greece, where they came in, and now they're taking massive amounts of hard assets after getting the uh, country onto this debt chain and letting it run and run and the bills piling up. That's why so many candidates, uh, independent parties like Libertarian Party, I remember Harry Brown, I remember uh, Ron Paul talking about how get rid of the income tax, get rid of the IRS, and all you have to do to replace the money that the IRS is bringing in is to roll government back to where it was about five years ago. That's how rapidly this government is growing, and that's how little this uh, of money that is being supplied by the IRS for all the harassment. It really isn't about revenue. It really is an instrument of political control. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to say, Rob? Yeah, I just hope that our people of America will have strong enough something inside and they'll help us take back the country. Absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing when we see that they are using things like a gift tax, as, they point, as we pointed out earlier when we talked about that article, hasn't been used since 1982. It was declared as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, yet they simply do it. They're charging people 12 times uh, the amount of fines that were put in under Obamacare just because they can. They do whatever they wish. Uh, let's go to Brad in Louisiana. Brad, you wanted to talk about artificial intelligence. Go ahead. Yes, Dave, thank you. Um, artificial intelligence is a scary subject, uh, primarily because I feel like the morality and the ethics that's going to be defined are integrated into this artificial intelligence is being uh, programmed by unethical and immoral people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the propagation of these programs, I believe, is, uh, is due to their own deep-rooted acknowledgement of their own lack of intelligence and ability. And, you know, we have the, the Constitution here in the United States, but I believe that the government is separate from the United States today. There is a distinction, there is a difference, like Alex says, the war is on, and their Constitution is one sentence, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that was a quote from Aleister Crowley, which goes to uh, underscore my belief that it is an entirely sinister and satanic movement. Thank you, David. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you look at artificial intelligence, you understand that when they're doing this data mining, when they're doing the pre-crime analysis, when they're going to flag somebody, it's going to be done by, and it's not generalized artificial intelligence. It'll be specific artificial intelligence. But the computer will spit these names out, just like the name that came out. And if you've ever seen the movie Brazil, you know, it comes out, it's a Buttle. And this guy, they're actually looking for a guy named Tuttle who really hadn't done anything either. But that's what's going to happen. It's going to be spit out by the computer, and these people are going to not question the uh, presumptions that cause that name to come out. So anybody can put any kind of criteria they want in there. And as you correctly pointed out, there is no ethical connection to so many of the different technologies that we're doing, whether or not it's artificial intelligence or whether it is uh, bioengineering or nanotechnology. There's so many different areas that our government is weaponizing and creating these technologies that have the, the possibility of getting out of control and taking down most of humanity. Gigadeth is the way Hugo Deguerres talked about an out of control artificial intelligence. Sorry to the rest of the callers. That's all the time we have uh, for today. And if you'll join us uh, tomorrow at 11 Central, we'll be right back here on the Alex Jones Show. And Alex will be joining us with live reports from Europe. Stay tuned. We'll